Welcome everybody to my first talk tonight. This is going to be about getting back in control of your SQL. And also I uh, look at the subtitle. SQL and Java could work so much better together if we only let them. A little bit about myself first. I'm the founder and CEO at Data Geekery, a little company in Switzerland, in Zurich. And I'm personally very much of a SQL aficionado and even more of a Java aficionado. And I personally believe that SQL is a device whose mystery can only be exceeded by its power. Right? So we certainly agree to this. SQL is a very corporate thing, so if you talk SQL, you do something like Oracle, DB2, SQL Server. So I'm, I'm, I've been talking to my lawyer recently and I've um, been advised to show you this little uh, disclaimer here. Please read through this disclaimer. Right? I've been to too many conferences by Oracle and you always have the safe harbor statement. Oh, never mind. Okay, let's talk about SQL. So, SQL was very powerful, I told you, right? SQL is extremely powerful, and this is my reaction when I forget the WHERE clause and my DELETE statement. It's so powerful, you can do that. Oh my god, I'm production. Right, who has done this before? A couple of you? You can dare say now your coworkers aren't here, your boss and I. It happened to me before. Uh, luckily, it was Oracle. It had a very special statement, so in Oracle, you can just do a flashback query and say select star from the table as of timestamp five minutes ago so I could recreate all the data but it was horrible so SQL is very powerful SQL and Java it should work together like this so today I'm going to use this electricity metaphor throughout my talk SQL is your electricity it is in the plug and you plug in the jack into the plug and the pl jack is actually your appliance so your, your application that you're developing and you want data or the electricity to go into your application it should be as easy as this but I'm Swiss, I don't have this kind of jack, I have a different jack, and the reality is actually like that. So this is how SQL and Java really work together, and it's much more complex to get them to work nicely. So before we get to Juke, we just wrap up a little bit the history of SQL and Java from the beginning. So this is how you write SQL and Java normally. JDBC. Who in here has worked with JDBC? Everyone has, I guess. Who in here loves working with JDBC? <laughs> no? I always see one or two hands. Uh, the nice thing about JDBC is, is it's a very, very easy API. You only have to remember three types. You have the connection. From the connection, you prepare a statement. And from that statement, once you execute it, you get a result set. And that's it. It's a very simple API. And you have to put yourselves at the mindset of the 90s. So this was in 97, I believe, JDK 1.1. When uh, back then Sun stole the ODBC API, recreated it in JDBC in Java, they actually managed to uniformly access all of those databases at the time that were barely even standardized. So SQL was very new, the SQL standard was very fresh, and they managed to actually standardize everything in one API in Java. So this was a great invention, but it's also, um, I'm always talking about the good parts and the bad parts. There was a couple of problems with JDBC, so this is quite small. I'm going to zoom in here a little bit. I want this to be a very interactive talk tonight, and I've hidden six, six bugs in this piece of code. So who can tell me which are the six bugs? If you find a bug, just shout. You don't have to look too far, they're very obvious, very typical JDBC bugs. We've all committed those, just like forgetting the where clause. Any bugs? It's been too long. When have you last touched JDBC? You have. No, 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 no. No? You don't do any bugs? Not anymore? Any idea? Typical JDBC bugs, folks? Yeah, what could go wrong with this, right? Yeah? Exactly. So the first set int on line number 8 could be wrong because on line number 3 we have a question mark, a bind variable, that is in a conditional expression. So if this account is false, we don't render the bind variable. We render an empty string. So we don't take that into account when it binds the indexes. This is really horrible. So you have this kind of a dynamic SQL 
and you always have to remember which bind variable you've actually generated, which one you haven't. Really, really horrible. People get this wrong all the time. Very good. Number one. Number two? Yes? The missing space the before from? Yes, exactly. The same line as another bug. So if on number three we have is account being false, we bind every we generate an empty string. So we concatenate the txt empty string from. We were, will be missing the from keyword, right? So we're missing this uh, this uh, white space. So we have a syntax error. Very good. Typical bugs. You usually notice in production, right? Because when you write this code, you don't also don't do uh, integration testing and nothing. Just ship it, right? Customer calling. Oh my gosh, syntax error. What else? Number three. Simple injection type. Very important. On number seven, we have a bind variable that is not a bind variable. We've just concatenated user input possibly. This could be from a select, from a drop down. We've concatenated user input into the SQL statement. So if this contains a, an apostrophe, semicolon, drop database, you're screwed. Exactly. And if, even if it's not user input, you could still generate syntax errors. Very good. So we're left with three more bugs. Yes? The CLOB variable could be null. That's correct. Let's assume we know it's not null. <coughs> but it could be on line 15. Nothing? Exactly, so this has been a long time ago. We've all migrated to Java 8 probably, at least to Java 7, but in Java 7 we've introduced the try with resources statement, so this probably won't happen anymore. But before Java 7, we had to eagerly close each one of those resources in the correct order with the correct try finally blocks and everything. So this is not being done here, this is completely wrong. You might be leaking resources. Very good. Two left. Yes. The name of the field, the text, is exactly. not the same uh, in the select. Exactly. The Probably the intern came and thought this has to be renamed to txt and forgot that lower down. We didn't select by index, but by uh, table column name. So the text column has been renamed, but only at one place. And the final one, I'll resolve it. I've never heard anyone know this. This has happened to me in production once with a customer. and. Um, Unfortunately, or fortunately, depends on the point of view, in Java 6 and JDBC 4.0, there have been introduced a couple of new methods on the CLOB, BLOB, Array, and SQL XML types. And the method is called free. Now, if you don't call free on all of those resources, you don't have to. It's not like a resource, like a close. But sometimes, not calling free means you keep the CLOB alive, and it might sub survive the transaction, because those CLOB connections they are outside of the transaction. They're not necessarily in the, inside the same transaction. And you have a huge resource that is not garbage collected immediately because you didn't call free. This is not a memory leak. This is just maybe too late for the garbage collector to actually collect. So this is very important, especially with when you're using Oracle. In Java 6, from Java 6 onwards, always call free on your CLOBs and BLOBs. Remember this. Very important. So these were the six parts. I've had written them down here again. If you want, I think I'll share the slides with you afterwards and uh, you can look this up. So what JDBC means for developers, when you go back to the electri electricity metaphors, if anyone of you has ever tra traveled in Southeast Asia, this is going to be JDBC in the sky. And um, it's like this. So it's very error prone. It's very risky. We don't risk our lives, but we might, might risk some, some application failures because it's just always this kind of patching stuff. You're probably building an API on top of JDBC just to avoid this kind of mess. What happened next is this. So anyone here remembers EJB2? Yes? No? No one? With joys? A little bit? There have been a couple of good ideas in EJB2. We don't want to write that JDBC code. When we do all those insert update deletes all the time, we don't want to write them. We don't want to expose that kind of logic to the client. So the client, which is the client of this interface or this API, 
They should just have a customer request object, something like this, and they should just be able to find it, remove it, change it, and not, not really care about what really happens behind the scenes. So when you do CRUD, this is a good idea. You don't want to write the CRUD SQL statement. On the other hand, it, it really, it really uh, went really bad. So this is some code. You don't have to be able to read it. It's a WebLogic uh, XML configuration. I've written this one myself as well for a customer some time ago. Let's look into a couple of details. So there are a couple of settings in WebLogic here. If you're using WebSphere, it's completely different because none of this is standard. Um, for instance, I could specify the max beans in free pool to 100. Or I could say max beans in cache 500. So what, is, what, what does it mean? In the free pool, 100, does it mean I have a contention when 100 users simultaneously use a customer request entity bean? I actually have no clue what I'm doing here, right? I know this because I copy-pasted this code from another entity bean and it worked there, so it probably works here as well. This is why it's EGB2. Um, EGB3 is much better. EGB3 has a much better API and it's also called JPA20. And it came from Hibernate and it was standardized into this API. We have these events here in the example, which is persistent in the Entity Manager. We can query the events. It doesn't really matter if they have already been flushed to the database or not. We can query them from the cache and we can iterate. So everything is very nicely condensed in one single API. It's a very useful API and it, it has gotten rid of, of many of the EGB2 flaws with the configuration. It's much simpler to configure. configure. So this is the whole configuration you actually need for your entity beans now in EJB3, right? So what about this? Why is this good or bad or different? Um, one thing that few people think about when they just choose JPA for default in their application, it's very useful for some use cases, but when you do that as a default, you have to think of it like this. You have your schema in the database. Usually after a while, you don't generate the database anymore, you do the DDL. Hopefully you do it at first already, so you have a well-designed schema, but not everyone will agree on this one. But you have a schema in the database. Now you have a second schema that you see here. And that's the one you think about, is the Java schema. You have a second copy of the same schema, represented as Java classes. But the only schema that really matters in your application is the third schema that you never think about, really. It's, it's the annotations that you have here. So the only schema that really matters in your application from then on is the one you define in, in, in the annotations. Because the one in the database and the one in your Java code have to adhere to these annotations and they're limited in scope by what the annotations can do. And it goes on and on and people have tried to write JPA code like this. So who has written JPA code like this before? Yes? Did you enjoy that? it gets really, really complex, right? So people wanted to avoid writing the SQL code. Remember at the beginning, EJB was to avoid the CRUD code, the boring parts, but at some point you might need to specify the joins that you really need if you have an M2N, a many-to-many -many relationship, and you're writing your SQL in a different declarative language which is specified in annotations. Just not to write SQL, right? So I've had... Uh, a couple of talks and conferences about these topics. I've been very lucky to talk to um, the expert group from the JPA team, so I can give you an exclusive JPA3 preview tonight. I can show you what JPA3 will gonna, is going to look like. Right? I'm just kidding. Uh, but still, I have no idea what I'm doing because all of these annotations, they go out of hand. And I'm also adding XML annotations and all these things declaratively on top of my, of my what was it, a collection or something. And I don't know what all of this is doing anymore. We've asked the industry experts, you can, you can check it up on this website here. So we have a couple of opinions and annotations over there. And I found a very interesting quote by Albert Einstein. And uh, it goes like this. I don't know with what annotations JPA3 will ship, but JPA4 will ship with sticks and stones, right? And this is going to be JPA4. We're going to go back to the roots. Okay, you don't have to take everything seriously I'm saying tonight. JPA has a couple of very good use cases, and these are the use cases. So if you have this object graph persistence problem, if you want to load all of those entities, 20, 30, 40 entity types at once, modify them, and then persist them again, that's what JPA is very, very good at. 
That's what they solved, because you don't want to have all control of the, the locking behavior. That's extremely complex. To get the updates, the inserts in order, so you can avoid the locks, it's very up, uh, complex. It's also very complex to, to actually even think about what happens if you remove something from a collection here and then you add it over there. How does that translate to SQL? That's what JPA does. But maybe when you were thinking about SQL, you were actually just having this problem. And uh, JPA might have been overkill. So this is not just a, a product selling uh, proposition here. I've actually also talked to Gavin King. And Gavin King himself said, himself said just because you're using Hibernate doesn't mean you have to use it for everything. A point I've been trying to make for about 10 years now. If you don't know who Gavin King is, Gavin King is the creator of Hibernate. And no one listened to the poor guy. Hibernate has always had just a very simple native SQL API, and it doesn't do a lot. It just helps you to write uh, bind variables easier, so it, that's all it does. It's better than JDBC by doing bind variable binding easier. But Gavin King has always said, if you need the report in SQL, just do SQL. Don't try to shoehorn it in JPA. But people didn't listen to him. They thought, okay, this is going to be the solution, right? Because the problem when our applications don't work is SQL is wrong. That's what they thought. So maybe we should abandon SQL. And especially in recent days and years, now years, there have been a lot of hype about big data. So NoSQL and big data are two buzzwords that are very interconnected. So I have a quote for you about big data. The quote reads, our service ran at 99.99% uptime in the first quarter of 2009. It runs more than 200 million transactions a day and has sub-second response time. And we are constantly making advances to deliver it even faster. So this was in 2009. And now we have 2015. I'm pretty sure this company that I'm talking about here is, uh, has grown a lot. It's one of uh, the biggest growing startups from early 2000s. They probably have reached well more than 2 billion transactions a day. And does anyone here know who said this? Yeah, it's, it's kind of uh, out of the blue, so I'm solving this for you. It's Mark Benioff, the founder and CEO of Salesforce.com. And when he said this, he's talking about this Oracle database. And he's the guy that invented the cloud. So he's the guy that has this whole, invented the whole story of big data and all this stuff on one server, and he uses Oracle. I mean, obviously he does, because he was an Oracle employee before he created this company. And he's a close friend to Larry Ellison, so he uses Oracle, obviously, but... You can do big data with Oracle or with other databases, uh, relational databases. I'm very Oracle biased, so you can substitute Oracle with any other database if you want. But uh, I have another example. So here we have 300 terabytes of data files for production DBs in total, 140 terabytes of expected growth, etc. I don't know, I, I've never managed these kinds of sizes. Have you? So who said this? Do you know? Who is managing this database? It's CERN, and they're using Oracle Exadata. I could show you another example. I, I failed to actually show the, the numbers, but Stack Overflow runs on one single SQL Server instance. And they have a second one for the rest of Stack Exchange. So they have actually two SQL Server instances. What they do is just Memory is cheap. Today you can, you can buy terabytes of memory for, for less than $100,000. Put just memory in it. Make sure the logging works so when you have a crash you can uh, uh, redo the logs. And that's it. You have to keep everything in memory. It's super fast. You can scale up forever. Well, not forever, but quite a while. Quite a while. So what I'm trying to say here is people always, when, when it's about no SQL, people always talk about you don't have ACID anymore, you don't have type safety anymore, you don't have those standards anymore. You always hear those arguments from Oracle, from IBM and everything. And obviously you don't have big data because big data isn't that big in the end. Your data is not big data. But I have another interesting point that few people point out. So if you're considering moving away from SQL, which is awesome, I mean SQL is awesome, if you're move, considering moving away, have you asked operations? Who in here is a developer? Everyone. Who in here is an operations person? No one. Okay. Let me tell you another customer story. So this is a bank. They have a 
medium size e-banking system. The largest table has two billion uh, rows. Uh, it's, it's, I guess it's medium sized. And um, they have a large operations team. So 10 people in the IT department and 20 people in the, in the uh, requirements engineering department. So all of those people, they know SQL. They know how to write SQL. So the IT guys, obviously, they, they need to know it because at times in production they have to patch data. They have corrupt data. They have to type, just type update something. And sometimes it's really scary. I've been with them. The stuff they do with production database, I, sometimes uh, you shouldn't do these things, but um, they can if they have to. Imagine if you have a proprietary NoSQL database or something, you have to call the vendor. Oh, can you please deliver me a patch program in Java or something like that? It's not going to work as well. And the nice thing in this case with the customer is also the requirements engineers. They know SQL. They can actually just check do we have this data? Do we have to call the vendor to modify the e-banking system? Or can we already, with the existing data, do this new functionality? They can just do a select from where. Your grandmother can do a select from where. It's so easy. That's what SQL was made for. So just to wrap this up, there's a little history of NoSQL in notation. So uh, this was seen at O'Reilly Stratacomf. Uh, the slide was presented by Mark Matson. O'Reilly Stratacomf is a big data conference in the United States and it talks a lot about Hadoop and these things and when he said no SQL means no SQL this really means that people are starting to do SQL on Hadoop mostly Oracle these days and the IBM Oracle calls this big data SQL and they they sell it as a whole single unit of, uh, of work they work together with Cloudera to, to get this uh, up and running and the point I'm trying to make here is Everyone who was criticizing relational databases was actually criticizing the model and the storage system. But SQL as a language, it's universal. You can use SQL for every kind of storage system. SQL is really awesome. So let's talk about SQL. And when we talk about SQL, are we talking about SQL 92? So I stole this slide with permission from Marcus Winnant, an excellent SQL engineer and SQL performance consultant. Many people know the original SQL 92 or 89 standards. This is like talking about Windows 3.1, MFC. You've probably written better applications than people then, right? So we're going to look at some really fancy SQL examples. And this one here, I'm going to show in the second talk more in depth. So I'm just going over it quickly, just to make the point. We're going to calculate a running total. And how are we going to do this? First off, we have a bank account transaction table here. Imagine this bank only stores IDs, value dates, and amounts. We want to calculate the balance on each row. Imagine the bank doesn't have the balance on the rows. Now, how do you do this? We just say, okay, the top balance equals the balance below it plus the amount next to it. Then we move on and we say the balance below the top one equals the balance one further down plus the amount next to it. And that's why it's called a running total, because you just run through all of your rows and keep adding up the balances or subtracting them. You can do this uh, top down or bottom up. And if you see these kind of uh, formulas, you Im immediately recognize your product manager would do this very easily in Excel, right? So it just drags and drops the formula down, and he has a running total in Excel. So this is not a SQL topic. Running totals are a very interesting topic per se. But how would you calculate this? Would you do it in Java? Or in SQL, the right answer, of course. In SQL. So this is how it looks. And as I said, I'm going to go into details of this afterwards. Who has seen these kind of clauses before? Anyone? Wonderful. We are going to learn the most awesome SQL feature tonight. I'm going to show a couple of wonky, quirky ones as well, but this one here is really the most awesome one. Um, just to wrap it up real quick, um, yeah, I have to show it right now. So, when you see a statement like this, you always start with the from clause. SQL is a bit quirky, so select is actually not the first logical clause of the statement, so from is the first one. We have to first get the tables, materialize them, and then filter them with the where clause. So that happens first. Uh, we omit the group by clause. But now you imagine you have selected from the transaction table only those rows that have account ID equal 1. 
Imagine this actually happens physically on your database engine directly now. Obviously it can be transformed and optimized, but imagine it is now in memory. All those rows are in memory. And now you go row by row through that rows in memory and you transform all of them with the select clause. So that's how SQL works conceptually. Now is the select clause and you have rows as input and you have rows as output. And one of the rows that is very interesting is the one that we calculate, the balance row. And it looks like this. We have the current balance. Imagine we have stored this somewhere in the example. We already have it. And we subtract this whole thing here. And yeah, in SQL, it's all about keywords, right? So many keywords. Oh my gosh. When you see it the first time, you might not be convinced it's a good idea. Especially when you do it and you got it right and finally, and then it's end of the day or weekend and you're off on vacation and your coworkers next Monday. Oh my gosh, what does this mean? What, what is smoke again? Okay, window functions. This is called window functions. And they are a SQL standard. They are a SQL standard since 2003. They are called analytic functions in Oracle, for instance. And they are available in all commercial databases and in Postgres and in Firebird 3.0. And they work the same way in all those databases. So they're really a standard. You can use them safely. Not in MySQL. They still don't have them, unfortunately. How to read this? Every aggregate function that you write can be transformed in a window function. So this here is a sum. And we take the sum of the, the amounts. That works the same way as an aggregate function. And then we have this over clause. And in the over clause, we have three clauses. And you have to imagine it like this. When we transform all rows, as I told you before, we go row by row, we apply the select clause. Whenever we transform one row, we generate a window over the rest of the rows, ahead and behind. And this window is kind of sliding. And the window is declared by the over clause. So now we first have this partition by clause here, which defines which of the rows of the whole result set in memory should even be considered. We only want the ones in the same partition. So we only want the ones of our own bank account, not of the neighbors. So that's like group by. Then, once we removed the rows that are not in the partition, we order them. We order the whole window again because we want to have the same order as the outside query. We want to have the logical order of, uh, of transactions, which is the value date and then the ID, if the value date is the same. And finally, we have the frame clause. And the frame clause just says, okay, well now we have all the rows, we have them ordered. Now, which ones do we want to consider? We only want to consider the ones ahead in this example. So this is very theoretical. In practice, it's like this. We're on this row number four. We want to calculate the balance. So we have the current balance. Remember, we have pre-calculated that somewhere, maybe in a view or something. We have the current balance. We want to subtract the sum of all the amounts that are on top of these. As easy as that. It's actually very easy. It's very logical. It makes a lot of sense. And if you uh, spend maybe half an hour in remembering all the keywords, you get a hang of it. And it's, it's really, really useful. And it's extremely fast because the database has materialized all the data in memory already anyway. So there's no indexing involved in anything. You don't have to do any magic. So the database can do this calculation ultra fast. Yeah. So I will say I love SQL. I suffer from Stockholm Syndrome because, I, as I said, the keywords are a bit wonky. You probably wouldn't want to write it this way. And I found another quote from Winston Churchill this time. So SQL is the worst form of database querying except for all the other forms. Right? But you don't have a choice. There is only SQL. Another example, more SQL calculations. Let's say we have um, um, we have a votation which one is the most popular database access framework and juke one obviously and uh, we have these data on the left in our database physically stored and the ones on the right we want to calculate now as always you don't have to do these things in SQL there are obviously reasons why yes why not we don't want to discuss that let's assume you decided you wanted to do it in SQL you can do it again with window functions and before I told you all the 
aggregate functions are, can be transformed into a window function, but there are also window functions that are not aggregate functions, like in this case, dense rank function. Dense rank means we can just generate a rank for each row within the window. So we order the window again by votes descendingly, and we assign a rank to each row. This generates the rank we've seen before. Very, very easy. And dense is just optional, so if you have two rows with the same rank, dense defines that the next row will be an immediate next value. So we have one, one, two. And if you leave away dense, you have just ranked, then you skip one. So you have two first and then the third. It's very useful for a couple of things. And the second uh, expression where we calculate the percentage is also very interesting. We have the number of votes multiplied by 100 divided by the sum of the votes over the whole window. So we take all rows, divide, uh, calculate the sum of that. That's how you calculate percentages. It's very easy and we don't have any group by here. You could, of course, also do these things in MySQL with no subselects, but then things get a little bit wonky and slow. With just window functions, it's extremely fast. Now, the point of this first talk is to talk about Juke. The second talk will go more in depth into these kind of things, but the first talk is going to be about Juke. And what is Juke? So, let's imagine you're a SQL Java developer. You want to use SQL, you want to leverage it. Maybe as complex as this, maybe less. But the point is, you're thinking in SQL, you have to now uh, decided you want to do this join and you want to do the out join or whatever, and you want to write it down. Your only choice right now, if you want to embed the SQL statement in Java, Without Juke is JDBC. Obviously, there are other frameworks like MyBatis and stuff like that, but if you want to embed it in Java, it's JDBC or some utility around JDBC. But Juke thought, we can take this one step further. This is the same statement with Juke. So we have the SQL statement, the same statement with Juke. You are in the mindset of SQL. You know you want to write it this way. Why not just type it this way? What Juke is, Juke is a domain-specific language written in Java, in a way that every SQL um, keyword is a Java method. Every SQL table or column is a Java object reference. Everything has types associated with it. And your Java compiler will type check this statement for you. You can't do anything wrong. You can't have any syntax errors. You can't have any column name misspellings. None of the stuff that I've shown you in the, J in the JDBC box slide will happen. I'll go into the details of this in, right away in the example section. Just one short uh, question. If anyone in here is using Scala? No one? This language is dying. It used to be, two years ago I did the talk and everyone, oh, me, me. Okay, if you did use Scala, it would look like this. So, once more back to the SQL on the Scala version. Scala has a couple of nice language features. They're also dangerous, but they're nice at some times, especially with Juke. You can leave out a couple of the dots and a couple of the parentheses because the compiler can infer them. It can say, okay, this whole thing, it must be, uh, the, the, compi uh, the programmer must have meant that. So this is extremely interesting in the front <coughs> class, for instance, where you see pull options, the table, and then just as the dot is inferred, and then the parentheses around the, the alias are inferred as well. And the other nice feature in Scala is that it has support for uh, symbolic method names. So symbols like the divide by, the slash, or the two pipes for concatenations, they are just methods. So you can have method names that are symbols. This is extremely useful. So before we show the, the examples, just a short note about uh, what Juke really is, in terms of the electricity metaphor, this is Juke. That's all, probably all you needed when you had the original problem that SQL and Java don't work well together. And a friend of mine, Axel Fontaine, who is uh, the developer of Flyway, has become a close friend of mine. He's always stalking me and I'm stalking him at conferences. And he said, please don't use such a Frankenstein image to model Juke. That's horrible. So this may be a better image, right? Okay. So. Um, I'm very happily taking any questions you may have during the demo. Just interrupt me. I hope you have many. I always have an answer. And let's see some live juke in action.
How much time do we have for the first one? One hour? One hour, as you wish. Usually the first one has more tracks, so we can stop any time we want. Or have another question round, so... 15 minutes or a bit more. 15? 15 to All right. half an hour. Wonderful. Okay. Before we get started, I talk too much. A little drink. Joke ships with a source code generator. That's very important because you have already designed your database. So Joke is a database-centric API. You have already designed your database or you have taken over a legacy database. It's all already there. Now you want to use those objects in Java, tables, and columns. So you run this code generator. And what it does, it generates everything you have in your database in these classes. So, oh, I made a mistake in the presentation. I want to show first what we're actually querying. So here I have an Oracle database. It's called Sakila. It's a port from the popular MySQL Sakila database. It has a couple of tables. What it really models is a DVD rental store. So it has films, all sorts of films. It has actors and uh, entity or association tables like a film actor to model uh, multi M to N uh, relationships. It also has one to N and many relationships and all sorts of things. I've also added store procedures to these examples. If anyone is interested, I think I'll do this in the pause or maybe afterwards. It's a more uh, hardcore um, topic, but usually Sakila is very good if you want to test something. It has ports and many databases. It's, it has just a lot of data and, and the, the usual relational concepts baked in. Now we've seen these tables. And in the code that I've shown you before, we have all the tables reproduced right here. So I can just use these tables one to one. And each of the table has a list of columns associated with it. So actor ID, first name, last name, all of these are columns in the actor table and they have a type associated with it. So, the first name is a string column. The actor ID here in Oracle is a big decimal column because it has no uh, a precision or scale associated with it. And the last update column is a timestamp column. So you have all the types already uh, present in your, uh, in your uh, Java application. And what I've done here to prepare this uh, ex uh, example is in fact I've just static imported all the tables. Now let's imagine this code that you're looking at here is in your data access object or wh wherever you put the SQL code. So you have just one place where just import all the joke types that are generated and the DSL, the joke DSL. That's all you need. From then on you can just start typing stuff. So let's do that. So I have this DSL object. I'll show afterwards what it is. From this object here, I can select, and you see all the sorts of overloads. You can select various aspects. You can select various types of select statements. I'm going to select actor first name and actor last name. And you see, I'm, have, I'm having here Eclipse ID autocompletion. It is not related to Eclipse. Eclipse doesn't know what I'm typing. I'm just typing these objects directly that I'm using from the generated code. You can use IntelliJ or NetBeans or any other IDE for the same effect. I'm selecting these columns here from actor and now I'm calling fetch. I'm going to execute this code now. I should remember the keyboard shortcut finally. And what you see here in the console now is there is a statement being logged. So what we think a joke is most often when you start using a new framework you want to have some default debug log output. You have that with Spring and Hibernate and everything. You want to have the formatted uh, select statement here in the log output but you can obviously turn that off and you probably also want to have the first five records just to debug of every statement that you're executing. So that's what's happening here. So we have selected first name and last name from the actors table. Very simple. Just a short note as I promised you what this DSL object here is. This is for the test setup. What I'm doing here is I'm creating this context object. It kind of wraps the JDBC connection. 
So I'm just wrapping a JDBC connection. I could also be wrapping a data source. These are the two default modes of uh, operation. You can also provide your own kind of mechanism to provide the JDBC connection. But all you really need to provide Juke with is a connection. So Juke really builds very tightly on top of JDBC. You have no other dependency. Then we specify the dialect. Today we're using Oracle. And a couple of settings for demo, like the formatting of the SQL code. That's all there is to it. Now, let's, for instance, imagine we want to, jo uh, we want to join another table in order to be able to count the number of films that each actor has played in. So we join the actor uh, film relationship table, the film actor one, and now we get a compilation <coughs> error. This doesn't work. It's wrong. We're missing something. We're missing the on clause. So every aspect of your SQL statement is type checked by the Java compiler. Obviously, Java compiler doesn't know what it's doing. It's just a regular Java API. I'm going to show right afterwards how it works. So now it will compile again. The point here is select is a method that returns something that has then a from method in it. So the type here is the select from step. And when it's called from, after the from, you get a type on which you can call join. And this join is optional. This is why the whole type extends another type where you can add where. So the whole language is modeled with interfaces. It's actually very easy to model a domain-specific language only with Java interfaces this way. You can also use that yourself if you want to create a kind of a builder pattern. It's very easy. Not just the builder, because builders are actually always called on the same object. So if you have a string builder, you just call append, append, append on the same object. But in a DSL, you have grammar. So sometimes you have a clause, which makes that you can't use the other clause. You have to choose between each one of them. And that's how it works here. So now we have joined this table we want to group by. We group by these two columns. We do that in order to write count. And as I told you before, I've in, uh, static imported all the, the methods from DSL. So I get all the functions that are available, available in SQL directly here on my, on my Eclipse class path. Just type count, and I'm done. I can execute this. And I get the first names, the last names, and the count. Count of films, correct. No questions so far? Just when you rename the count code. The what? When you rename the count column as the, the the actor column. No, the count column. Oh yeah. Name. How you rename the count column. So if you want to call this X, you just call as X. No, it's not a stupid question. In the end, the point here is really, you have the SQL statement in mind, and if it has a SQL clause, there's probably a method that has the exact same name. With the exception, of course, that SQL uses keywords that are white space separated. We can't do that in Java. But uh, you see that with group by, for instance. It's a Java method. But when you do the count as x like this, you will get the x also in the result. That didn't work. Did I already forget the keyboard shortcut? So now you have this X here, which will also generate an X on your result set, obviously. Now we can also rename tables, and this is an interesting aspect of SQL. In SQL, you can use stuff before you declare it. You can use a table that you've renamed in the select class, even if it's declared later on in the front class. This obviously doesn't work in Java. Unfortunately, now we don't do that kind of magic, but you can declare the aliases up front before the statement. You have renamed actor to A and film actor to FA. Let's imagine the use case is a self-join that you want to do later on. So you can just rename all of these as well. Be sure to catch all of them. So you see it still compiles. Why does it still compile? 
because the object that you get back from this as method is also an actor type, but with a new name of the table. But it inherits all of the, of the instance fields, which are the columns. So the columns are going to be renamed as well. And when you execute this, the SQL statement you're getting uses aliases for all the tables. So this is going to be extremely powerful. You, there's no limit in the complexity of the SQL statements that you can write like this. We have seen a customer SQL statements with 400 lines of SQL or even more in Juke. So that's probably the, the amount of the, the point of time when you can say, okay, maybe we'll start writing a view. That's up to you, but um, there's probably no limits to how complex your SQL statements can get. Yes, more questions? Now the type you're getting back from this fetch is this nice looking one here. So if you've been loving generics before, it gets much better now. Um, we have all the type information of the record associated with it. So we know there are two strings and one integer. And this result. This goes up to 22. We have to limit ourselves to some uh, degree. We can't go infinitely far. And 22 was chosen because Scala has 22. It's kind of a random upper limit. When you go further, you just don't have the type information anymore. What you keep having is, for instance, when you do fetch one, let's assume we only have one result. If you don't want to have all this type safety, you can just use the generic record type where you don't have the type safety. This is what's applied after 22. But when you have less than 22 columns, this whole thing is extremely useful. Let's assume we're going to write the union. So we have a union here. And SQL is an extremely type safe language. So in SQL, when you select something, you are generating a record, a record type. You're generating this ad hoc record type, and it is well defined and it is well typed. People often don't think that SQL is a type safe language, but it is extremely type safe. Uh, you don't think so because uh, you're using Java and in JDBC you're losing this type safety. But if you're using PLSQL or Transact SQL or some other stored procedural language, you have a compiler that type checks all your select statements. And the same is true for Juke. So if you have a union, you have to have subselects with the same row types. You can't just go and say, in the first subselect, or what we're doing here before I do the example, just imagine we take all the people in the, in the database. So actors are people, customers are people, etc. And we want to union them. So in the first subselect, we have first name and last name. This means that the second subselect is invalid if I just select the first name from the customer table. This is invalid SQL, and the Java compiler will tell you that it's invalid. So this union method here has a little red underline, which reads, you have a method that is expecting a record two string string, but you're passing it a record one string. So imagine a huge select with three union, four union, five union subselects, or union all, or whatever, you mix that together, and you add columns to some of the subselects, but you forget one. You don't want to notice that only in production, right? So you have to provide all the necessary columns. Does it work with star? Does it work with star? That is a very good question. I've never prepared it. I'll address it right after. Uh, just it's wrong to use star. Yeah. yeah, there are a lot of reasons why it's wrong. Just one more example. So if you have a different type, even if you have the same degree with a different type, it won't compile either. So you really have to use the last name. Now, let's see the star thing. So star and juke would be just not to use any column at all. Now, juke doesn't know how many columns there are. What you're doing here with star is you're creating a select with this untyped record. Any record. So this will work. It might as well be that actor, at the time when you execute this query, has two columns and they match. So it will work. You can also do star here at the second subselect. What do you mean by that? Uh, in the select, you can use. Oh yeah, you could. From table. You could do actor first name. 
this will compile. It is also valid SQL in the sense that uh, it compiles also in SQL. It's just semantically wrong, but syntactically correct. And it's very hard to actually assess whether this is semantically wrong or right, because let's assume this here would be a, a table valued function. I don't have one ready, but just say function returning table. This is a good example, by the way, whenever you're stuck with something that Juke doesn't support out of the box, you, there's always a way to do plain SQL. So you can always embed just a string, which contains the SQL you really wanted. Maybe even with bind variables. So if this function takes two arguments, you can pass them like this. So right close to the SQL where you're writing it. Now, back to your question. This function could actually return a first name table, a uh, column. Might be possible. So you can't check these things syntactically. Also, we don't have any validators because the database validates stuff good enough already. Yeah, it's a good question. I have to remember the star one. That's a very nice one. It's probably all, all these generics are oh, screw it. I'm just going to make it work. <laughs> Compiler, stop bitching at me like this. I've read this uh, funny statement recently on Reddit. Do you? I, I wrote an article and put it on Reddit, and the article ha uh, his name is "Do you really understand group by in SQL?" And it has a couple of very interesting aspects how group by works, especially in the later SQL standards. And one guy wrote, "Hell no, I don't understand group by. I just keep adding those columns until the compiler stops bitching at me." All right. Okay. So another example. And remember, this are a couple of uh, more advanced examples just to show the case, but uh, you can write any kind of SQL very easily, also the simple st stuff. But the simple stuff is not impressive, so I'm showing the advanced stuff. And you're probably learning something as well that you've never seen before, like this one. So who has used this syntax before? Notice the WHERE clause. A couple of you guys. Yes? Row value expressions. You've used those. Awesome. Not all databases support them. They are in the SQL 92 standard. And how they work is this. We said before, when you have a select statement, you are creating ad hoc rows, row types, or tuple types. So you're creating those ad hoc. And you can have as many rows as you want in a tuple type. This means that SQL the way we use it most of the time is using just a one single row in a tuple when you have an in predicate, for instance. But you can actually add more than one row in the in predicate as well. But you have to have the same number of rows on the left side as well. So here we're creating, we're creating a tuple with two rows from the outer query, and we're comparing that tuple with the tuples from the subselect. That is really awesome, very useful. It's, it's incredibly useful because it's also very readable. You could write the same query with exists, but that would in, in inflict a couple of uh, uh, additional predicates and would be much more nasty to write and read. This one is very straightforward. So this is also supported in Juke. What we do here is we have to have a keyword and we use row. Row is the SQL standard keyword to construct these um, tuple types. It's optional, you can leave it out, you just have the parentheses. And actually, parentheses are optional if you only have one row. So that's the caveat there. So the one row thing is actually a syntactic trick. It's syntactic sugar. You're actually always comparing tuples. So we write customer first name, customer last name. We have this in method on the row type that is getting back. And we see all the overloaded selections that always use something with a two. So we have either row 2 or record 2 or result of record 2 or select of record 2 with two string types associated with it. So we just use the select here, actor, first name. Now this compiles. This wouldn't compile. Obviously, right? For the same reason as before. So this has been a bit sophisticated. Not everyone uses these features every day. One of the features I keep forgetting, and I will think of it right now, is um, I've only shown select. 
Obviously, you can do anything with Juke. Also, insert, update, delete, even merge. If you're daring, who uses merge? Who knows merge? A couple of you. Merge? No. Merge is a merge is a beast. Merge says, I want to merge something into a table. Well, so far so good. And uh, the next clause is the using clause. So we say, I'm using this as the data source. And then you have an on clause, like a join. So we joined the data source with destination. And when you have a match, you do update. When you don't have a match, you do insert. And when you have a match in some databases, you can also do deletes. So you can write these kind of horrible statements with match on update and on insert and everything. And uh, you just merge data into one. So it's, it's kind of, it's not absurd. Some databases have some sort of absurd, like MySQL has with on duplicate key update, and other databases have absurd or replace. It's not really absurd. It's more uh, useful for bulk updating. So if you just update one row, it might be tricky, and you might want to look, uh, look after your locking behavior. But merge is very useful. So look this up, merge. It's really, uh, once you do merge, you do merge uh, quite a few times, and it's going to be, it's going to be looking nice if you like SQL. But another thing that's also very interesting is we've talked about CRUD. And life's too short to do CRUD, right? Life is just too short to do the boring CRUD. So what we want to do is we want to select an actor where actor ID equal, oh, this is big decimal. Huh? I'm going to hate myself for never having refactored this schema to int. Okay, let's just take this actor equal 1. Fetch 1. So when you select this, what you get back is an actor. Now the difference in this query from the other ones is I've not specified a select clause. I've just specified the front clause. This means I'm going to know I have a row of type actor of the table type. So before we've seen the row types, so row 2, row 3, row 4, this one has even a stronger type. It's also a row 4 type, so it implements record 4, but it is also an actor type, and this nice thing of this is I can just do actor set last name, adder, actor, first name, Lucas. These are generated methods, and then I do actor store. So CRUD is really too boring, and you don't need JPA to do CRUD for you. If you're really on a table-based model, so you, you stay close to SQL, there are a couple of other frameworks out there as well, especially from the Ruby side, they call this uh, active record. So you have a record that models a record in the database and, and has all these useful features on it. You don't want to remember which columns you changed and which ones do you have to update. And this has a couple of nice other features in it, like optimistic locking is supported as well. So if someone else modifies the same record at the same time, the store will, will uh, blow up on you. So these are a couple of nice features once you have a SQL API, it's included. Are there questions? More questions? Now what we believe is going to happen in the near future, once Java 8 is really adopted and, and well adopted, you're not going to map too much anymore with automatic mapping. How am I going to write this? I've prepared something here because I'm not really uh, very, very fluent yet with Java 8 APIs. Especially the stream is very fancy. I love it. But it is a bit verbose. So when I have called fetch, I get a list. So a result in Juke is a list of records. And in Java 8, every list can be transformed in a stream. So now I have a stream. I can map this stream to something if I want. So I have all these records coming in with all the types associated with it again. But let us assume that we actually want to do the grouping in memory in Java. So let us assume we want to have each actor and the list of their films. I hope I will get this right. Otherwise, excuse the demo effect. So.
So we have film actor film ID equal film film ID. Now, if you want to do this kind of mapping in a new style with functions, the nice thing is, I'll just use the prepared statement here. Yeah, the nice thing is, you can keep things very nicely separated. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'll just leave that there here for the next time. So the top part of this query, this is executed in the database. This is going to be sent off to the server, executed there, and you will materialize a denormalized list of actors and films. That's very easy to understand. And the second part here is the grouping that you want to do in memory. Now you can group this in various ways. You can, you can instead of doing it all in one statement, you can keep the result around in memory and stream it several times. Let's assume we're just doing it in one statement. The second part is going to be in memory. It's cleanly separated, but still it's very fluent. It's, you, you transform the whole thing in one go. And let's try to read this. Who has done some Java 8 yet? Anyone? Going in production or just experiment? Production. Production? Wonderful. So uh, I think about this time of the year, uh, Java 7 goes out of uh, support for, for free version, so it's about time people do this anyway. What we have here is a collect method. So collect is uh, Java's way of saying reduce in a way. It's not the same thing exactly as reduce, but when you have map reduce concept, collect just reduces the whole stream into uh, a couple of values. In this case, I'm going to get a map, and the key of the map is a string. And the value of the map is a list of strings. So the key is the actor, and the value is the list of movies he played in, the list of films. Now, the first argument to this collect method, does it have more than one? The first argument is how we group. So this is a function again, or how it is called. It's a collector, obviously, because we pass it to collect. So it collects values. And we group by, and the key is provided by this function here. So this is a function. I'm going to add a new line here to make this more readable. So this whole thing here is a function that transforms a record provided by the juke stream into a string. So we're taking the first name, adding a, a white space, and we're taking the second string, the last name and returning that. So that's the group key. For each record we have a group key. And then we do the mapping. The mapping is another collector, so to calculate the value we have to collect values into some <coughs> object. And we're returning a list. All of this stuff, have you heard, have you hosted any Java 8 talks yet? Yeah. By uh, Raul Gabriel Urma perhaps? Uh, no, for the streams it was, so for the Lantas it was uh, Oh, wow, wonderful. The street, yeah, very good talk. We should be coming to repair them, I think. Yeah. And uh, for the streams API, it was Jose. Uh, okay. Wonderful. I think this is one of the harder bits of Java, the Streams API. The lambdas are very easy to understand. It's just uh, anonymous interfaces, more or less, with some syntax sugar, plus behind the scenes they're using uh, Invoke Dynamic in a short version. But the Streams API is a bit more tough to understand because you have all these generic lambdas and everything combined. So if you look at this, um, what Eclipse shows me here, it's kind of hard to get the types right, right off, out of the box. I guess this is something that needs practice. I personally believe that uh, in, in three years we won't look back. In three years everyone will write streams out of the box because it's a standard API provided by Oracle and it will be very easy. But right now I'm sometimes still struggling but it's, it's really very fun to see the results because we have this mapping here and we also, for each mapping, so every time we group, we have a mapping of the group value, uh, of the, the aggregated values and we take the movie title 
and we're putting that into a list. So we're collecting this into a list. So uh, uh, you've obviously already heard the talk. So what we get here is this map of string and list of string. And we can for each this also fluently. We get the key and the value. And what we get here is an actor and the film list. Let's execute this. Good question. I'll answer right after. So here we just see the actor and the list of strings to string. <coughs> so when does the interaction happen with the database? It happens here. So this is explicitly not lazy. I didn't choose it to be lazy because I called fetch. And Juke makes the assumption that most of the time you want to materialize everything at once. JDBC was written at a time when resources were very scarce and you wanted to do everything lazy. You even didn't want to do any boxing of the integers and stuff like that. You wanted to use only uh, primitive types. These times are over, so most of the time when you have five records, you want to fetch them in memory and release the connection because that is not a scarce resource. You want to release the connection as well uh, as quickly as possible to the pool for other threats in the server to use it. So fetch is the default, but of course sometimes you have a large result set and you want to do it lazily. And then you can call fetch lazy. And fetch lazy returns a cursor, which maintains an open result set internally, so it just has to be closed, like the result set. Uh, but you can iterate over it and just take one record by one. So Juke still supports Java 6, which is unfortunate in this example, because with Java 6, um, what we're returning here, the cursor really is, the cursor type is an iterable. And I've even had the discussion with Brian Getz once uh, about iterable. Why is there no stream in iterable? Because that would be really wonderful. So iterable and stream should be the same thing. No, not the same thing, but they should be, you should be able to transform an iterable in a stream. And he gave me a very interesting response about this. It's because, do you know the answer? Yes. But there's a, I mean, you have a stream on collection. So the default implementation doesn't have to be the performant one. So each iterable can specialize the implementation. I mean, it's, it's just about declaring it because Juke supports Java 6. And still, I could stream the collection because the collection is now in Java 8, been enhanced, but not in Java 6. And the interesting thing with the iterable is they already thought ahead in, in time. It's very interesting to talk to these people and, and learn from them because they already thought about Java 10. In Java 10, they're going to specialize generics. I'm not sure if it's going to happen. I'm just still a bit doubtful if they actually make it. But what you can write in Java 10 is you can write things like this. List of int. Oh, my gosh. So you can write list of int, and how they actually trying to pull it off the current plan of Project Valhalla is, um, have you had a talk about that as well? Well, I guess it was introduced. Uh, in Certainly. I'll just, about that in I'll just review. I've read a couple of papers that have been published. No, you didn't talk about the demos. So. Yeah, it's very fresh. They, they didn't know how to do this. Yeah. Well, they knew how to do this, but they didn't release it because they didn't want anyone to tell them, well, oh, don't do it this way. Because... The way this works in Java 10, how they project it right now is they're going to create at runtime a new class, like C-sharp. They're going to specialize, or like, like C++ does it at compile time and C-sharp does it at runtime. They specialize generics at runtime and generate classes for each combination that you're actually using. So they're not generating all the combinations that are possible because that would be horrible, especially if you had Juke record 22 and you have to, this will explode. But they're going to specialize those types that you use. Now, the problem here is, let's assume this would compile, and we have something here. List x raw type. This won't work. <coughs> because of backwards compatibility. You can't assign a list of int to 
uh, raw type list. They're not, not compatible. The list of int inherits all the methods and types and everything from the list. It will act like a list, but it won't be a list. It will be some listish thing. And then he, he went into the details and everything, and I actually don't uh, really get the point. And this is like the, the, the comic when you have, and then something magic happens. Or have you ever seen how to draw an owl? I have to show this one. This is hilarious. Just to make the point, how to draw an owl. Yes. Draw some circles, and then draw the rest of the fucking owl. Okay. <laughs> So he explained with this, and it made sense at the time, but the point is, because of this, if they added stream on interval now, they couldn't write Java 10 this way they intend to. Because they would be, be breaking backwards compatibility in five years of code that is written today. Too bad, so we have to do what you suggested, I never remember. This is going to be horrible stream. Support. We have to first do a stream of this splitterator, and we have to. How do you do a splitterator? Splitterators, I think. And we can do a splitterator of a iterator. Oh my gosh! <coughs> and then you have the iterator. I hope I can remember the other parameters. So this is an iterable. So we call the iterator here, and we have something. Oh, what was the other argument? Boolean? Does it go here? Uh, true. Let's just assume it's true. And the other one was zero or something. Now we have a stream, no? No, it wasn't correct. Oh my gosh. Splitterator. They could have really done something much easier, I think, for this case. Long and int. Long and int. Zero long and zero and this is the true yeah today we're going to do until this thing stops bitching at me obviously we would actually do the right parameters and now you can lazily fetch the results so this means okay it doesn't matter much because we do collect so it's a kind of a stupid exercise but if we didn't ma uh, collect but uh, do something lazy we would now actually have a results at stream we've done huh so when do you support stream Right. <laughs> Probably in Juke 4.0. I don't think this is going to be the game changer here. These one or two little uh, changes because you can use already lambdas with Juke uh, when you want to map stuff. So when you do fetch, lazy uh, fetch here, you can pass a lambda here already, I think, to as a record mapper and map stuff yourself. So there are a couple of uh, <coughs> Java 8 features are already possible, and this one here. It's really nice to have, but we have a lot of customers on, on uh, WebLogic uh, 10 something. Yeah, but we disavoid the, the creation of the temporary list, which we call all records at the same time in memory. What well, we did here, yes. So even if you pass a lambda or whatever function in the fetch method? No, when you do fetch lazy. So then currently with the fetch <coughs> iterator, you are. Yes, you are losing. Yes. Yeah, with this one, yes, it's easy. But, uh, but again, I, I think how many times do you actually need a lazy result set stream? We're, we're kind of uh, valuing here yeah. the amount of customers that still need Java 6 and, and the this. The point of streams is to avoid the, the temporary collections. It's one of the points. I believe this point, I personally believe this point was very much overrated by the expert groups because they wanted to get the parallelism API in and uh, for instance they have no functionality, well very few functionality for sequential streams. So um, I don't know if you've announced this but uh, we have a small open source project also that's called to Lambda. We're uh, doing this for our integration testing because we do that with Java 8 and we really love using streams and functions to generate data on the fly and we've added a couple of features when you just type sec for sequence and then you can add, you can just wrap any of these types, we're adding more types on the, on the, as we need them and then you can just type iterable here 
and it's going to be much easier than this whole mess. But it works again. So the point here is uh, we believe that they actually focused so much on being everything lazy and parallel, which is very useful in some cases, but in 90% of your application you need sequential and you don't need lazy. I'd say. I mean, if you start using functions, you're going to use them everywhere. You're going to transform every list and every map with functions. And they're already materialized. They're not, you don't need lazy on them. I believe. But I may be wrong. So this sec, I'm just going to show a little bit more about this. Because, um, do we have time? No? Since you wish, we'll have this time for the second talk. It's going to be a bit short. Okay. I'm just going to do five minutes. Okay. All right? So this sec is uh, very useful. We, we stole a couple of API elements from Scala. We believe that they should be there. So I never remember this collect grouping by stuff. So what I'm going to do here is <coughs> just going to undo this. I'm just going to write group by. I'm not, I'm not sure why this is not on stream. It would be a, such an easy win to relate to the other methods because most of the times you don't need to actually instantiate the collector and the second collector and the third one. You actually just need this lambda here. Group by. So this is the group by criteria. And now I really hope I don't get into the demo effect. The second argument would be how to generate the list. And hopefully this will work. No? <laughs> All right, I did this at hoc. I wasn't sure until tonight if I should prepare something about Julanda. Uh, but the idea here about Julanda is really just if streams were never parallel, always sequential, we'd be able to also have things like cycle, unzip, zip, as we are used to from functional programming. So zip is when you have two streams, you want to make one of them. And we've also added tuples, like records in Juke. We've added tuple support between 1 and 8 degrees. So you can use those because functional programming without tuples is kind of uh, incomplete. The tuples are very important for functional programming. Fold left and fold right. Scan left and scan right, so you can read into this if you've never done it before. Maybe you don't see the point yet, but we just believe that there are a couple of things that could have been in the streams API if it was only sequential. So sec itself is actually a stream. It extends stream, and it just says all of sec instances are <coughs> considered sequential. That's it. So Julamda has a couple of these features. We've also added support for resulted streams in here. If you don't want the juke dependency, the full one, you have a very simple one. So you can have a string-based SQL execution and then have resulted streams. Interestingly, this didn't make it into the JDK, probably also because they already see, okay, if in the future we add value types for records, and if we do this already now, then we will break the compatibility again. That's probably the reason. Yeah, so that's it. Julian is just a short uh, excursion here. I guess we can talk about it in the break if you want. I'll wrap up the talk about Juke before you go to the well-deserved pizza. Another statement from Mark Benioff. All companies benefit when they can afford to focus on innovation rather than infrastructure. And that's what we believe in. Your guys' work is not SQL. You don't want to do the JDBC infrastructure work. You have banking stuff to do. You have insurance stuff to do. You have logistics software to do. <coughs> Where the plug meets the jack, you don't want any friction. You just want to plug it in. And we solved that for you. Uh, what Juke is, is it's a database-first API. So you've seen today, Juke works best when you also work database-first. When you have a domain model-centric application where you just first write the Java model, and you don't care too much how it persists, then that might not be the best way uh, when you're using Juke, because Juke always expects a schema to be there already, from which it reverse engineers your entities. You can also write um, your own database provider in the code generator, when you have an XML model, for instance. 
but in principle it's database first. Performance is very important for us. We're very close to the method <coughs> with SQL. So if you want to optimize your SQL statements, it's very easy to do with Juke. The metaphor is Juke is type safe JDBC, nothing more than that. We don't do any magic at all, so everything goes directly to JDBC and to the database. Code generation, I told, is very important. We do the active record stuff, and um, store procedures is out of scope for most of the talks. If you're interested, I'm happily going to show you examples for those as well. SQL transformation is something very advanced, so I'm not going to show examples today, but if you want to have role level security and you're not using Oracle, you can actually transform the SQL statements generated by Juke. Every time you're using the accounts table, you can add another predicate. So you can prevent developers from accidentally showing all the data to a user. Probably not always the best idea to do it in Juke. You should have various levels of security, but it's just one additional layer. And SQL standardization is something I didn't show today. Your code is likely going to work on Oracle, Postgres, and all the other databases. So we have a lot of documentation and API to validate that the SQL actually works in those databases. And we transform stuff internally. So those functions that have an equivalent function in the other database are going to be redefined. And if your row value expression in predicate is not supported, well, we render an exists predicate. We transform that stuff. We have all those integration tests for you that make sure that it runs on those databases and it's documented. So, a shameless book recommendation shortly before the end. I told you about Marcus Winnant. This is really a book I want you to read. Not because I, get any, I don't get any provision from this, but I've read it myself. Uh, my own return on investment was huge. So this was the best book for entry point level uh, SQL developers about indexing. And that's probably all you need to know to get your SQL performant. It explains very easily how indexing works how a balance tree works and why you should use it. And it shows a couple of caveats in, in four databases. I think now he's added the fifth one. So it, it covers MySQL, Postgres, SQL Server, Oracle, and DB2, I believe. And shows you the most important aspects of tuning your application yourself. It only costs 10 euros online, the PDF, and you even have to juke discount 10%. So we've worked so much together with him that he gave us this uni unique juke discount. This is very awesome. A little bit about Juke again. So Juke is open source for open source databases. We give it away for free with the Apache license. If you're using MySQL, Postgres, H2, or whatever open source database you're using, we currently support, I believe, nine open source databases and also nine commercial ones. For the commercial databases, we have commercial licenses. We're now going to be adding SAP HANA as the 18th database. Talking about big data, right? So that's it for the first talk. Usually this is the last slide, but stay tuned for the second talk. If you found my humor funny, there's my Twitter account, the personal one. If you didn't find it funny, please stay off that Twitter account. There will be more. Um, the blog is very interesting because whenever we discover stuff, we do a lot of down to the metal SQL and also Java. We've discovered a lot of uh, bugs in Eclipse mostly, but also in the Java compiler. We reported them, but we blog about that as well. It's very interesting to learn about these things and, and when we write, then, then we reflect things more, more thoroughly and, and we want to share this knowledge with you. So the blog is not only about Juke, it's also about Java and SQL and open source development. And the Twitter account also just republishes these things. Plus we also tweet very interesting SQL and Java articles from other authors. So if, you, if you're in that area of interest, then uh, please follow our blogs and Twitter accounts. I guess that's it for the first talk. Stay tuned for a second talk. It's going to be about more awesome sequel. Thank you very much.